Hey everyone, it's Caleb. Welcome back. This episode is number three in your blockchain series. Now, if you're just jumping in from search or whatever, welcome. I think this series is great if you want to start from the beginning and learn all about blockchain. But this video specifically, we're going to learn the theory behind Bitcoin. Where did it come from? Where do Bitcoins come from? All these questions around Bitcoin. There's a lot and it's fairly new to a lot of people, so it can be a little confusing, but we'll figure it out. So before we get started writing, you know, I wanted to say special thank you for Crypto.com who makes this content possible. If you want to get started with a Crypto.com account, use the referral code Caleb. It's a fantastic app to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. One of the great things about Crypto.com is that it supports a ton of different cryptocurrencies. So you're not just going to get Bitcoin and Ethereum, but a lot of different ones. And I usually end up on Crypto.com because some of the cryptocurrencies I want to purchase aren't available on these other apps. And if you get started with a Ruby debit card, we'll both get a $25 bonus. So if you want to support this channel, that's how you can do it. But enough of the sponsor message. Let's get back to Bitcoin. Sound like I was going to say back to business, but no, we're getting back to Bitcoin. So what in the world even is Bitcoin? Well, I'm not going to get totally into the basics of what Bitcoin is because we already talked about that in the previous two videos. But basically, Bitcoin is a peer to peer online currency. So the ability to pay money from one person to another person without having to go through a centralized entity. It does go through the network. However, this network is decentralized. These nodes are owned by numerous different people. Where did Bitcoin come from? Well, it came from a person or entity. I don't know, Satoshi Nakamoto. And nobody knows who this is for sure. There, there's a lot of interesting stories. And if you are interested in the history, you can try to figure out who it is. A lot of people have been trying to figure it out. So that's fun. Nobody has come out clean saying, oh, I am, I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. But the blockchain started back in 2009 with the Genesis block. And every time a block was added, there was a block reward. And this is one of the things defined in the protocol of the blockchain. We talked about blockchain protocols in the previous episode. And this block reward is basically an incentive for people to try to confirm these blocks. And that is the whole concept behind Bitcoin mining. If you contribute your computer as a mining node, you can process and there's a chance you can get that block reward of 50 Bitcoin, which dang, that would be a ton of money. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way because this Bitcoin reward, this block reward is cut in half every four years. So it started off at 50 and then it went to 25. Yeah, we're doing basic math here, uh, 12.5. And now we're at 6.25. And it's going to keep doing that. And eventually it just goes to zero. At that point, is the incentive to Bitcoin mine gone? Not entirely, because there's still going to be transaction fees. So with every transaction, there's a little bit of fees. And these get added up together and are given in addition to the block reward to whoever confirms that block. They say the first commercial transaction for Bitcoin was buying two Papa John's pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin, which would be worth like unlimited money right now. But beyond Papa John's, Bitcoin really had a dark start often used in black markets. And I think as time has gone on, it's gone mainstream. And now the demographic is more just normal people instead of, you know, drug lords and serial killers, which is always a great thing. So now Bitcoin, it, it still has that dark past. I mean, we, we can't ignore that. But Bitcoin is being accepted by numerous people and becoming normal to people. Now, how do you actually acquire Bitcoin? Well, the easiest way, in my opinion, is to sign up for a service like Crypto.com. And I'm not just saying that because they're sponsoring the series. Although this is a perfect time for me to say their name because you can go to a service like Crypto.com and you can buy cryptocurrencies using fiat money, which is just United States dollars or euros or not cryptocurrency. <laughs> and when you do this, there is an exchange, right? You have to pay for it, but you also have to pay with your information. And this is usually because of laws, at least in the United States. I'm not really sure about everywhere else in the world. But the, the companies that sell cryptocurrency have to adhere to the laws where they're selling it. So KYC laws are a thing in the United States. 
So in order to sign up for one of these services, you, you will usually have to get a photo of your identification, maybe a photo of yourself, and possibly even a photo of you holding your identification. And this is basically to associate your account with an actual person. And this is required by law. It's not just that company collecting information about you. It is required anytime you're trading fiat currency for cryptocurrency. Well, not everybody wants to do that, right? Not everybody wants to associate their cryptocurrency balance to their identity. So in that case, you would need to acquire cryptocurrency through some other means, preferably not on the black market. But you can accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. So if you're selling a service or selling a product, you can accept Bitcoin through a wallet. So for example, I use the Coinbase wallet. It's very handy. And that is a wallet that's not associated with an online service. So I have full ownership of the seed phrase and nobody has access to my account except myself. That's a little bit different than some of these wallets that are attached to online services. And I'm not saying those are all bad, but that is a layer closer to centralization. If you think about it, if you're trying to send money to someone, or actually let's just say this is me and I'm trying to send money to you. And one of the options is to go through a bank. And you know, a lot of the financial transactions will be settled in banking somewhere. Like honestly, all this is abstracted away so well that most of us don't even really know how money works or how transferring money or buying things actually works. We just buy stuff, it comes out of our account and we're all happy. But when you transfer through a bank, the bank does financial stuff to basically settle that transaction, or they're basically filling the role of confirming that transaction. Well, if you say, ugh, we don't like those third parties, those intermediaries, we don't want no centralized entities, we're gonna get rid of that bank. And instead, I'm gonna use a service <laughs> like, like an exchange. And that's where I'm gonna store my wallet and then I can pay you from there. Well, if you think about it, who owns an exchange? A company, which is a centralized entity. So by keeping 100% of your cryptocurrency balance on an exchange, you're kind of missing out on the whole larger purpose of cryptocurrencies, which is to not have to rely on an intermediary for online transactions. We don't wanna to have to trust centralized entities. Now, do I believe all centralized entities are evil? No, I don't. I mean, a lot of the services I use are centralized entities. Companies are centralized entities, and these companies offer services. So if you take a bank, for example, and you get rid of it, and you just do it all on your own, well, that gives you more risks. You're responsible for more now. So this is where a lot of people screw up. They lose their cryptocurrency, and there's nothing they can do about it because they didn't realize all of the services that the bank offered. So when they get rid of the bank and they get rid of the exchange and they just manage that money on their own, well, there's a lot more responsibility and there's a lot more risk. So in my opinion, it's less about removing 100% of centralized entities and more about having knowledge and ownership over what you're delegating to these centralized entities and not just trusting every company to take care of you. Ultimately, that responsibility is your own. And when you manage your money yourself, then you start to really think about what you're doing with your money because you can't just call support and be like, yo, bro, I lost my money. No, you can't do that. So Bitcoin is a permanent transaction. And that is one of the most important things about this. With centralized entities, there's opportunities for transactions to be reversed. Bitcoin, it's not possible. So now I wanna talk briefly about Bitcoin mining. We're gonna have a dedicated video on how this works, but basically Bitcoin mining is the competition to confirm these blocks. So we have these full nodes that support the Bitcoin network. And these nodes do not get Bitcoin or paid to do this. So there's not a direct financial incentive to create a full node, but there are various benefits of creating a full node. One, you might just want to see 
Bitcoin be successful. And if you have a lot of wealth in Bitcoin, you're gonna wanna make sure Bitcoin is as successful as possible. So in that situation, you might set up a full node. It's also recommended by the Bitcoin wiki to run transactions, at least really important ones, through a full node. And that gives you the most security. We're not gonna get into that entirely right now, but it is important to know that there's different node types. We have full nodes, we also have mining nodes, so we'll just draw some of those here. And we also have simple payment clients, often known as SPV clients, simple payment verification. You have to rely on these full nodes. If you wanna be as secure as possible, you will want that full node you rely on to be yours. So that way you know it's following the rules, it's doing everything it's supposed to to support that Bitcoin network properly. But I'm getting a little sidetracked. What in the world is Bitcoin mining? Well, if these are the, the miners, we have three miners right here. These are the ones that confirm the transactions by basically putting computational effort into confirming these transactions. And the way this works is there's a hash function and we have to get a certain output below a certain target. And we're going to guess the input that makes that output, the hash value, valid. So again, if you've never heard of this, this is probably just like, what, it's confusing. But we have to guess a hash value lower than the target. And we do that through guessing an input that we pass into a hash function. It's actually a double SHA or SHA-256 hashing. So we'll go into all the details of what that means when we talk about Bitcoin mining specifically, but basically this node and this node and this node, all of those mining nodes are going to compete to get this valid hash value because they want that good old Bitcoin reward, right? So if they win, they get 6.25 Bitcoin at the time of this video. If you're watching this five years in the future, it's gonna be half of that. This proof of work system is actually really important because it protects the network. In an earlier video, we talked about how these blocks are connected in the blockchain and you can have something like a transaction that's three confirmations. And basically what that means is we've done this proof of work process getting a correct hash value three times, which is very time consuming. And it's gonna take 30 minutes based on the block time. So the block time on Bitcoin is 10 minutes. A new block is every 10 minutes. So getting three confirmations is gonna take 30 minutes. If you wanted to change that history on that blockchain, you're basically going to have to redo that proof of work three times in competition with the entire Bitcoin mining network. So it's very, very difficult because you are only a small percentage of the Bitcoin network. And now this introduces some interesting challenges, like what if you own 51% of the network? Or what if you own 40% of the network and you know you just got really lucky? And those are all challenges that are like the details of Bitcoin, and we're just trying to learn the basics here. But just understand that there are challenges to this kind of system. Okay, but this is starting to look really sloppy, so I'm gonna erase it. But the main thing you need to understand is that the deeper the block is, the more confirmations, the more challenging it is to change that block. The cryptocurrency protects the network because it incentivizes numerous people to contribute to that proof of work, which makes being malicious very difficult. It also makes being malicious very costly because you're going to have to contribute a lot of computing power. And even if you did manage to get enough computing power, there's limited things you can do because if you imagine a transaction, let's say getting 0.5 Bitcoin, and it goes to the address uh, that you own. So this is you and you own this address. Well, if you own this address, that means you have the private key. And basically when you have that private key, you can confirm very easily that you have permission to spend that Bitcoin. You know, if you go and try to spend it at another shop, you sign that transaction using your private key. It's essentially impossible to fake a transaction because you need that private key. 
So even if you do get computational power and you can fake these transactions, the full nodes are gonna reject that. Now you can do some things, you know, you have your own private key, so you could in theory spend the coin twice possibly. I guess I don't really know because I've never really done a ton of research on how to hack the Bitcoin network. I should probably do that though, because you know, pfft, ethical hacking, right? <laughs> The whole idea behind Bitcoin can be seen in a previous technology called Hashcash. And with this, let's say in order to send an email, you have to just use a little bit of computational power. You know, you got to calculate something or something. Well, that's not going to hurt you if you're just sending a few emails to your friends or to colleagues. But if you're trying to send spam to thousands or millions of people, that computation is going to add up and be very expensive. So it disincentivizes spam mail. Wait, is that the way to say it? <laughs> yeah, it disincentivizes a spam mail. So that was an example, and that principle was foundational and proof of work. Basically, if you're going to maliciously attack the Bitcoin network, you're going to have to pay a lot of money. And it's probably more profitable just to use that computational power to mine cryptocurrency. So that's why a lot of these blockchains have cryptocurrencies associated with them because they're basically an incentive for people to protect the network. So other than that, you know, some of the limitations of Bitcoin, you know, it can't support hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, more like seven at the max. So it's pretty limited on transaction speed. And I'm sure there's just a ton more that I need to learn personally to truly understand the power of Bitcoin. But you can read the white paper, it's on bitcoin.org if you want to understand the technical introduction of the subject. It's a pretty good read if, um, if you're into that kind of thing. I tried to read it a couple times and it is in fact very helpful. There's also a Bitcoin wiki, so that's very helpful for more uh, easy to consume content. And you can continue to watch this wonderful series. So thank you for watching. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, corrections, whatever, leave them in the comment section below. And if you want to support this channel, just go ahead and sign up for Crypto.com using the referral code Caleb. Be sure to subscribe, like the video, and I appreciate all of you. I'll see you in the next one. Also, just like an extra warning, don't fall for any of the scams. I'm sure there's going to be, some, anytime I talk about Bitcoin, they're spamming in the comment section. Don't fall for any of it. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.